Welcome to Module 7, PCC 289M, and we're in Chapter 7, Configuring Advanced Active Directory. So let's take a look at that. We did a little uh, uh, general uh, Active Directory in the previous module. Now we're going to def definitely go deeper in to Active Directory. So let's take a look at our objectives. Configure a multi-domain environment, a multi-forest environment. These are going to be for larger environments. Uh, describe Active Directory trusts and configure them. Upgrade domains and forests. Configure Active Directory sites and replication. So in a large organization, it's going to be necessary to build a structure composed of several domains, multiple trees, possibly even several forests. And we talked about what some of the, uh, those were in our earlier modules. Most small and medium-sized businesses choose a single domain because it's simpler, lower cost, easier to manage, and easier to access resources. A subdomain maintains a common naming structure with the root, so it's a third-level domain. So, uh, for example, if we have this csmtech.local, you could have this split up into subdomains by geography. You could have us.csmtech.local or by business unit, you know, publishing or accounting or whatever it is. When creating the subdomain, uh, consider the following. What server will be the first uh, D domain controller, it says CD, but DC, for the new domain. What are the names of the subdomain and the new DC? What AD act, uh, Active Directory related roles will this fill? Which site are you going to install another one? And who's going to administer it? So we've talked a little bit about mergers and acquisitions. This is something that happens to just about every IT administrator if they're in this business long enough. And if you're an IT consultant, then you could even specialize in this type of business. So when two companies merge or a large company splits into separate business units, you have a multiple tree structure. Adding a tree to an existing AD forest isn't that much different from adding a subdomain to an existing tree. So you need, you need to have a name for the tree and it includes a top level and second level domain names. So let's take a look here. We've got a forest of two trees. This is the same thing we've looked at in the past. And you've got the csm.local, which is the parent, and the csmpub.local, which is another parent. So completely two different forests. And you've got the uh, child domains underneath it, which we were also referring to as subdomains. So don't get confused if you hear me say subdomain or child domain. They mean the same thing. They're just a, another name to the left of the fully qualified uh, domain name of csmtech.local. So we need to configure an alternate UPN suffix. So user accounts are assigned to suffix. That's the same as the domain. So, for instance, you've got JSM at csmtech.local. csmtech.local, that's your UPN. In multi-domains, you might want to configure multiple UPN suffixes to make logons easier. Trust relationships. It defines whether and how security principles from one domain can access resources on another domain or one forest to another forest. So it's established automatically between all domains in this, the forest that you're in. AD trust can exist between domains and between forests. So users can access the resources across the domain without having to log in more than once. So you have to set that up correctly. Otherwise, every time you try to log into the other domain or the other forest, you end up getting prompted or denied. You can create two-way trusts or you can create one-way trusts. Now, by default, a child domain or subdomain only has a one-way trust. The child trusts the parent, but the parent doesn't trust the child, just like in real life. So a two-way trust allows for both you know, to happen. So you can think of that as, say, a marriage, where the husband trusts the wife and the wife, wife trusts the husband. At least that's the way it should work. So um, you've got automatic trusts, which are configured between domains in an AD forest, and those are also two-way trusts. So both, both one-way and two-way trusts can be transitive, or non-transitive, and that basically means whether or not they'll inherit that information. So you've got uh, domain A trusts domain B in our trust relationship. So let's define a transitive trust. If domain A trusts domain B, and domain B trusts domain C, then what happens? Automatically, A trusts C. So by default, if you use a transitive trust, then that's what's going to happen when you add domain C in. Automatic trust relationships created between domains in a forest are transitive two-way trusts. Referral, the process of a DC in one domain informing a DC in another domain that it doesn't have the information 
about a requested object. So it requests a referral until it reaches that information. Let's talk about forest trusts. It provides a one-way or two-way trust between forests. Created between the root forest root domains of AD Forest running 2003 or newer. A forest trust is transitive, just like we talked about before. A and B and then C drops in, automatically gets trusted. The trust isn't transitive from one forest to another, however. So all domains in one forest trust all domains in another, but it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the trust isn't transitive from one to the other. So external trusts, one-way or two-way non-transitive trusts between two domains that aren't in the same forest. So generally, these are used in certain circumstances. So when you want to create a trust between two domains in different forests, to create a trust with a Windows 2000 or a Windows NT domain, which are really old, of course. Or a Realm trust used to integrate users of other operating systems into a Windows domain or forest. So an external trust is when you, you trust but verify. <laughs> so it's a one-way or two-way non-transitive trust. So if A trusts B and B trusts A, then C is going to be trusted. Well, that doesn't happen in a non-transitive trust. So C is going to have to have its own trust set up. DNS must be configured so that the fully qualified domain names of all participating domains can be resolved. So when you do create these, um, these linkages between forests and domains, you've got to replicate the DNS zones as well. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to find each other. So you're going to need to manually add replication for these DNS zones from one domain to the other. So if there's no computer A in uh, the uh, company B, then you, ha you have to assume that that computer A is in the other domain and you need DNS to do that resolution. So before creating a trust, make sure you can resolve the fully qualified domain names by uh, other domains by using the NS lookup or similar tool. Or you can just ping, you can just say ping, and uh, you know, uh, server a dot csm dot local. If you can get to that, and that's in the other domain, then you know your DNS is set up right. If not, you need to add that replication to make that happen. All right, so let's take a look at the trusts. This is where a trust gets set up between domains. Uh, you've got your uh, forest root dot local, tree two dot local, et cetera, et cetera and you've got a transitive trust. So the transi transitive we talked about earlier is in effect. And you do that through Active Directory domains and trusts in the tools menu from Server Manager. So configuring a forest trust is very similar to creating a shortcut trust. So main consideration is making sure DNS is configured correctly in both the forest root domains. So there's three most common ways to configure a DNS for a forest trust. You have conditional forwarders, stub zones, and secondary zones. You can also configure DNS server to act as the root server for the DNS space. So um, a conditional forwarder is where you say, hey, if you're looking for this domain, go to that DNS server and you'll find it. A uh, stub zone says, hey, I don't have your information here, but that server over there has it. And a secondary zone says, hey, I've got a copy of the entire thing, but it's read only. And uh, that's probably your fastest way of getting resolution. And one of the things that I like doing the best in this kind of situation. Windows enables administrators to configure functional levels on new domain controllers to maintain backward compatibility. So you, you have to take in effect, you know, 2012 and 20, 2008 servers. Domain and forest functional levels are specified to domain controllers. So you always pick whatever your oldest domain controller is, and that's the level of the domain and forest you want to set it to. Otherwise, if you make it too new, like you make a 2012 forest and domain functional level, that 2008 domain controller is not going to work anymore. Forest functional level determines the features of AD that have forest-wide implications. Windows Server 2016 domain controller supports the following functional levels. It only goes back to 2008 now. So uh, 2012 went back down to 2003. So we've gone up a level to 2016. It only goes back to 2008. Forest uh, functional levels can be raised from an earlier version to a new, newer version, uh, but it says not vice versa, but that actually is not true. There is a way, uh, there is a procedure if you, if you went too high, you know, say you went to 2012 and you still had a 2008 domain controller, there is a way to go backwards, but it, is, it does involve some PowerShell commands. Windows 2000 native supports all the default features of an AD forest. The functional level is considered the baseline, and that's because 
that's the very first Active Directory version was Windows 2000. Windows 2003 supports all features of 2000 and adds Forest Trusts, uh, KCC, Link Value, and all the things you see there. Server 2008, that's the, when the first uh, version of 2008 came, came out, there were no forest-wide features added, but 2008 R2 has all features of 2003 and adds the recycle bin. So that's where we first see the recycling bin is in 2008 R2. Windows 2012, no big features were, were changed. 22, I'm sorry, 2012 R2, uh, no new forest-wide features, but all DCs must be running 2012 R2 domain functional level. And in 2016, we have some additional changes. We have features added with the Windows 2016 Forest Functional Level with Privileged Access Management, our PAM. Group Management Expiration allows you to add an account to a group temporarily. So uh, 2016 provides five domain functional levels, uh, have the same names as the Forest Functional Level. So it's basically the same thing as it was. A domain controller can't be configured to run at a lower functional level than the Forest Functional Level. Can be raised, but again, it says it can't be lowered, but you know, there is a way to do it. After a domain's functional level has been raised, no DCs running earlier versions of the OS can be installed in the domain. So you can't put uh, 2008 in after you've already upgraded, say, to a 2016. So Windows Native 2000 supports uh, supported only by Windows 2000 to 2008 R2. 2003 features include some domain controller renaming. You couldn't do that before. Uh, log on time step replication, selective authentication, and the other things you see there. 2008 added DFS replication, fine grained password policies, interactive logon information, and AES for encryption. R2 added automatic service principle names, authentication mechanism. 2012 added Kerberos improvements and 2012 R2 added authentication improvements, and 2016, no new domain functional levels. So we did see a lot of forest functional levels upgraded in 2016, but not a lot of the domain functional levels. So functional levels can be set when a server is promoted to a DC, or they can be raised manually on the DC. Before raising those functions, functional levels, ensure the DCs meet the minimum requirements. Otherwise, you could have a problem. So raising the functional level, just go to the Active Directory uh, domains and trusts or sites and services or use PowerShell. There's lots of different ways to do it. DCs advertise themselves by registering service records or SRV records with DNS. So if you don't see the service records for the domain controller, then DNS can't find the domain controllers and users cannot properly authenticate. If some of the SRV records are missing but others are there, then you're going to get hit and miss on whether things work properly or not. So how can you tell whether an SRV record is missing? Well, you got to go into the DNS manager. And uh, what I would do is go to a working server, a working domain, and just compare the two and make sure that the SRV records all match. Net logon service of the DC handles registration of SRV. So sometimes when you make a change, if you, you have to restart the net logon service to get that affected. So you can manually type the appropriate commands, net stop log, net logon, or just go to the services.msc program to do that. So here we see the DNS manager and an example of SRV records. So again, this points to where the domain controller is. And it also uh, allows certain protocols. You got Kerberos for authentication using the ticket, and you've got LDAP, which uh, is the uh, communication port using TCP 389 to query whether a user exists or not. The knowledge consistency checker is a process that runs on every DC for replication. Uh, KCC on each DC uses data stored in the forest-wide configuration directory partition. And it recreates this information every 15 minutes by default, although you can change that. Replication topology can be calculated manually in AD sites and services. Some changes to AD objects require special handling called urgent replication. So uh, one of those things would be an account lockout. So let's say the CEO of the company got locked out because he forgot his password, and uh, so he needs to uh, get back into the uh, Active Directory as fast as possible. It's like, I thought it was this girlfriend's password, but it turns out it was or this girlfriend's birthday. It turns out it was my wife's birthday. Oh, boy, it's a mess. 
So uh, he, end, he ends up uh, typing all of his girlfriend's passwords or uh, uh, birthdays in there and messes it up. So the administrator has to go in and make a change uh, so the computer account is no longer locked out, maybe even reset the password for the guy. And uh, then you um, have to have that replicate to everybody all at once. So when you, un uh, when you take a uh, an account off of lockout, it does what's called an urgent replication. It doesn't wait the 15 minutes to replicate to the domain controllers because you don't know which domain controllers he's going to authenticate to when he goes to log on. And then the user account password changes as well are also done that way. Uh, replication. So Active Directory sites and services can be used to force the KCC to check the replication topology. So you've got repadmin.exe. That's a tool that shows exactly what's happening and the replication status. So if you're like, hey, I don't know if this replication has happened all at once. What, how do I figure this out? Repadmin is the way to do it. Repadmin slash show repl. Uh, it can be used to show the partitions being replicated. It can force replication to occur, and it can force the KCC to recalculate the topology as well as other things. So when you go to um, uh, you know, create a second domain controller and you can't seem to get them to replicate properly, you can type this rep admin and do a forward slash sync all, and it'll force the two domain controllers to replicate right away. So you've got here the uh, DC1 properties, and this, these are the protocols that are used to replicate. So you've got IP and you've got SMTP. IP is typically used internal for uh, a very fast network. It uses full-size packets, so it works fine in a very fast uh, you know, internal network that's running a gigabit or faster. SMTP is used for slower WAN connections. When you want to replicate from one site to another, uh, over maybe a VPN tunnel or some other way where the connection is not as fast. So you, when you go into the site properties, you can change it from IP to SMTP. So as I mentioned, IP is used by default. SMTP is if you manually overwrite it. So the advantage of using SMTP, even though it's normally an email uh, protocol, is it uses much smaller packets. The DC can send multiple replication requests sim simultaneously without waiting for the reply. So lots of Great advantages for slower connections. Requirements for a bridgehead server on both ends of an SMTP configured site link. If you do uh, use bridgehead servers and you have, you have multiple locations with domain controllers and you decide to use SMTP, the SMTP must be, feature must be both installed on both servers. So both servers must show SMTP uh, as their protocol uh, for replication. If you only do it on one side, it won't work right. An enterprise certification authority must be configured on the network. So you've got to have a certification involved. The site link path must have a lower cost than an RPC over IP site link. And the DCs must be configured to receive email. So if you don't have port 25 open through the firewall, then the replication can't happen. Even though it has nothing to do with email, port 25 is what it's used to uh, send and receive SMTP traffic. So by default, the site link bridging is enabled, which makes that link transitive. Remember we talked about transitive? You can change the transitive behavior of the site links by turning off site link bridging and creating the site link bridges manually. Automatic uh, site bridging can lead to overutilization of a slower WAN link. So you may want to go in to the, uh, where the, the sites are replicated and delete some of those site links so you don't end up with this mesh site link that causes uh, too much replication to happen and slows down the network. Sysfile replication, this is where the, when you have global catalogs involved, and by default all domain controllers are global catalogs unless you uncheck the global catalog box. So some crucial information for the domain operation is, st is stored in the Sysfile folder, actually a lot of information. Sysfile replication uses the same replication using, using DFSR. So if you go into Active Directory Sites and Services, you go into NTDS settings of the server, you can choose to force a replication doesn't always uh, work right away as soon as you add a new domain controller, but usually 10 or 15 minutes later, it'll work. So tools for monitoring um, AD replication. I talked about rep admin earlier. You can also use DC DIAC. That gives a lot of information, so you might want to pipe that to a text file. PowerShell commandlets for monitoring, diagnosing replication. So you could also use PowerShell. Now, um, troubleshooting... Active Directory replication has been around a lot longer than PowerShell, which is why we already had the tools in place. 
But if you want to run these uh, PowerShell commandlets to do it, you can do that as well. So, in summarize, a domain is the primary identifying administrative unit in Active Directory. We talked about small and medium businesses having a single domain. Uh, we talked about replication, trusts, transitive versus non-transitive, and tools you can use to troubleshoot replication. So that will do it for Module 7, and we'll see you in Module 8, where we're almost done with the course.